Hi everyone, this is Kathy from House of TOEFL coming to you with part two of my video about the speaking section that can be found in the TOEFL Student Prep Planner. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, please go back and watch part one to this video. Today's video is part two where we're going to talk about questions three and four. Now, if you don't know how to find the test prep planner, don't worry, I'm going to link to it below. So you'll be able to find that. It's free on the internet. It's a guide to help you guys. And that's what we're going to be using today. I'll be speaking at a faster speed than many English videos because you're TOEFL students. So you have a more advanced understanding. So the first thing I want you to do is click on that PDF. Then I want you to go to page 55 in the PDF. Again, that's page 55. Once you get there, you're going to see the example for question three. Now, question three starts with a definition of a concept. It could be from psychology, sociology, biology, and so on. There's many, many topics they might choose. This one happens to be psychology. Now, as you know, I'm sure, you have 45 seconds to read this. This one is called flow, and we have the definition for flow. Step one is to write down flow in your notes and underline it. Now write down the full title. Don't take shortcuts. So I've written flow here. Then I want to skim and look for the word flow. And I find it here in the first sentence. In psychology, the feeling of complete and energized focus in an activity is called flow. Now the words is called are crucial because that tells me that this has the definition. So I'm going to write down feeling of complete energized focus. Then I quickly skim people who enter a state of flow, lose their sense of time and have a feeling of great satisfaction. I'm not going to write down that whole sentence. I'm going to write down lose sense of time, comma, satisfaction just keywords, and I can rebuild this when I talk. That just takes practice. Um, they can become completely involved in activity for its own sake rather than for any results such as money or prestige. I can't write all that down, but I understand what it means. It means they're not doing it for money. So I can simplify that by just writing down not for, and then the dollar sign, not for money. And I can make that into a complete sentence later. Now I always say the last sentence has something important. Okay. So this last sentence says, contrary to expectation, flow usually happens not during relaxing moments of leisure and entertainment, but when we are actively involved in a difficult enterprise, it stretches our physical and mental abilities. So I'm just going to write down involved in difficult enterprise. I'm not going to write down that whole sentence. There's no time. So my notes actually say flow, feeling of complete energized focus, lose sense of time, satisfaction, not for money, involved in difficult enterprise. When I go to read that, I'll have to fix the grammar and fix it into complete sentences, of course. Now I'm going to read to you the lecture part as if I'm the professor, okay? So here's the lecture part. I think this will help you get a picture of what your textbook is describing. I had a friend who taught in the physics department, Professor Jones. He retired last year. Anyway, I remember this was a few years ago. I remember passing by a classroom early one morning, just as he was leaving and he looked terrible. His clothes were all rumpled and he looked like he hadn't slept all night. And I asked if he was okay. I was surprised when he said he had never felt better that he was totally happy. He had spent the entire night in the classroom working on a mathematics puzzle. He didn't stop to eat dinner. He didn't stop to sleep or even rest. He was that involved in solving the puzzle and it didn't even have anything to do with his teaching or research. He had just come across this puzzle accidentally, I think in a mathematics journal and it just really interested him. So he worked furiously all night and covered the blackboards in the classroom with equations and numbers and never realized time was passing by. Okay. Then the, the prompt is 
Explain flow and how the example used by the professor illustrates this concept. Now you might be thinking, I can't write all that down. I agree, but what are the main points? What makes this flow? flow okay. First of all, this is something that happened to the professor. So stick to the past tense when you speak. Okay. You can't use the simple present in this. A lot of my students tend to use the simple present way too often, but this is an incident that happened in the professor's life that puts it in the past. So the main points are he saw his friend, professor Jones, he was passing by his classroom. The professor looked terrible and he asked him if he was okay. The professor said he was totally happy and he was involved in solving a mathematics puzzle and he hadn't stopped to eat dinner. He hadn't stopped to sleep, but it had nothing to do with his teaching or research. He came across it accidentally. He was interested in it. He worked on it all night. He never realized the time was passing by. Those are the main points that we need to write down so that we can reconstruct our answer. So let's go ahead and listen to a sample answer. This should be about a minute. Okay. According to the reading flow is a feeling of complete energized focus where we lose a sense of time and we gain satisfaction. And it's not for money or prestige. And it often happens when we are involved in a difficult enterprise. The professor gives an example from his own life when he ran into a professor in the physics department named professor Jones. A few years ago, he passed by his classroom and he saw professor Jones who looked like he hadn't slept all night and his clothes were all rumpled. So the professor asked if he was okay. And he was surprised that he said he had never felt better. He had been working on a mathematics puzzle and didn't stop to eat or sleep or even rest. And it had nothing to do with his teaching or research. It was just a puzzle he came across accidentally and he became interested in it and covered the blackboards with equations and didn't realize past time was passing him by. Then if you want at the end, you can say, this is an example of flow. That part's optional. If you have time, you can say it. I don't worry too much about it though, because you cover that by saying the professor gives the example of, okay. And you can see many speaking templates online, including in my own videos. Okay. So that's how you answer the third question. Now, please go to the next page of the PDF. And we have a lecture from a biology course. Now, you know, I'm sure that there's no reading portion to this particular one. You know that it is only a lecture and that it will introduce two topics with an example of each topic, right? So that's how this question, question number four works. So I'm going to read you this definition like I'm the professor. I'll tell you what the main points are in my opinion. Then I'll give you a sample response. Okay. So first things first, let me read the lecture. Now listen to a lecture in a biology class. Then answer the question. Human beings aren't the only animals that use tools. It's generally recognized that other animals use tools as well. Use them naturally in the wild without any human instruction. But when can we say an object is a tool? Well, it depends on your definition of a tool. And in fact, there are two competing definitions, a narrow definition and a broad one. The narrow definition says that a tool is an object that's used to perform a task, but not just any object to be a tool. According to the narrow definition, the object's got to be purposely changed or shaped by the animal or human so that it can be used that way. It's an object that's made. Wild chimpanzees use sticks to dig insects out of their nests. But most sticks lying around won't do the job. Mm, they might be too thick, for example. So the sticks have to be sharpened. So they'll fit into the hole in an anthill or the insect nest. The chimp pulls off the leaves and chews the stick and trims it down all the way until it's the right size. The chimp doesn't just find the stick. It could say you could say it makes it in a way, but the broad definition says an object doesn't have to be modified to be considered a tool. The broad definition says a tool is any object that's used to perform a specific task. For example, an elephant will sometimes use a stick to scratch its back. It just picks any stick up from the ground and scratches its back with it. It doesn't modify the stick. It just uses it as it's found. And it's a tool under the broad definition, but under the narrow definition, it isn't. 
because, well, the elephant doesn't change it in any way. End of lecture. Prompt. Using points and examples from the talk, describe two different definitions of tools given by the professor. Now, hopefully you followed along on the audio script. Of course, the audio script will not be available to you during the actual test. You know that. You'll just hear like you just listen to me. Hopefully you took some notes for practice. Now, can we repeat all of this in 60 seconds? No, we cannot. But what do we know? We can write down, there's two definitions of tools. One is a narrow definition. That's an object that has to be changed to perform a specific task. It's not just any object. It has to be purposely changed by the animal. And then she talks about the wild chimpanzees and how it sharpens a stick. And we can go into the details about that in our answer. The second is the broad definition. Uh, that's that it doesn't have to be modified. It's that any object that's used to perform a task is considered a tool under the broad definition. And she gives the example of elephants. So let's listen to what a sample response might sound like. And this should be about a minute. Because I didn't take notes, I'm going to be looking a little bit at my laptop um, because I couldn't take notes and read at the same time. But this is the ideal answer, okay? According to the lecture, there are two definitions of tools. The first is a narrow definition, which is an object that's used to perform a specific task is a tool, but it has to be purposely changed or shaped by the animal so it can be used for the, the task. She gives the example of wild chimpanzees. They use sticks to dig insects up out of their nests, but most sticks won't work because they might be too thick. So they have to be sharpened. So the chimp might pull off the leaves or chew the stick so it can fit into a hole of an anthill. So it makes this, and that's the narrow definition. Then the professor talks about the broad definition, which is that any object used is a tool. It doesn't have to be changed. And she gives the example of elephants. Elephants will use a stick to scratch its back, and it picks up any stick from the ground and scratches its back, and uses it just as it is found. So this is a tool under the broad definition, but under the narrow definition it isn't because the elephant doesn't change the, the stick. Now I know what you're thinking. Kathy, you were talking so fast. I hear that a lot. I have to because you only have one minute, so I tend to talk really fast. Then students also ask me or bring up the fact that they say, I can't both talk that fast and have good grammar, Kathy. So which one should I do? You can't pick between those two. I'm so sorry, you can't pick between those two. You have to do both. Um, so if you want a high score, if you're only shooting for a 21, 22, 23, then maybe you can make that choice. But if you're a pharmacist and you need 26 or a nurse who needs 26 or some teachers who do, you cannot say, okay, I'm going to not do so well in the grammar. I'll just talk fast. But you, you can't do the reverse either. Because if you talk slowly, you won't get all the points. So the next question I get is, but how do I achieve that goal, Kathy? The answer is practice. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Everyone thinks that I have a magic formula or if I don't, it's because, oh, I'm a bad tutor because I didn't tell them the magic secret. But guess what? I'm going to tell you guys the truth. No tutor has a magic secret. There's nothing above practice. And anyone who tells you they have a secret or a magic formula is not telling you the truth because this is a language test. You're not memorizing facts and writing them down. You're memorizing facts and writing them down. You're not. You may have noticed it's harder to pass TOEFL than pharmacy board exams or dental board exams. That's because this is a full language test. It's a fulsome language test. There's no way to get around practicing the studying you have to do and the grammar you have to study. So that's the bad news. The good news is many people do it every day. I get emails and messages all the time saying, Kathy, I'm so happy I passed. Now I can be a pharmacist. My dreams have come true, etc." So things that are worth doing that have high rewards do take work. So that is my inspirational quote for the day, because honestly, pharmacists and dentists make a lot of money. That's why it's so hard to become one. Honestly, if it was easy, everyone would do it. I would be a pharmacist, but I'm not because I know it's super hard and I don't want to pass all these exams and study so hard. So if you, but if you've gotten this far and you're so close to being a pharmacist or a dentist or a nurse or a teacher, don't let an English test be the thing that stops you. You will regret it. So please keep studying, keep working. Don't give up. 
nothing is impossible. Tons of my students pass. Okay, I guess that's all I have to say. My name is Kathy from House of TOEFL. I just wanted to leave on a positive note. As always, good luck on your test. And you can find my website at www.houseoftoefl.com. Be sure to subscribe to my channel. You can comment below. I'll be making more videos. So as always, good luck on your test. Thank you so much for joining me today. Have a great day. Bye.